Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My special guest is Barbara Widmer, who is the winemaker at Brancaia in Tuscany. And I say in Tuscany because they have three different estates, two in Chianti Classico and one in the Maremma. And the two in Chianti Classico are in Rada in Chianti and Castellina. And Barbara, you're joining us from where today? I'm actually right now in Rada in Chianti. That's where our winery is based in the Chianti Classico region. Okay. And how do the vineyards look right now? How's the weather been? It's, uh, oh, uh, now it's evening and it's, it's nice, it's blue, everything is green. Uh, so uh, it's in full vegetation, flowering was over end of May and so the berries are just tiny a little bit, a uh, little berries and they're just growing. Uh, I, we, we had very dry spring weather and uh, June started quite fresh and cool with a lot of rain, which is good. But now, of course, after two weeks, a lot of rain, we are looking forward to get into the real summer. Uh, and, uh, but so far, it looks good. Great. That's, that's good to hear. We all need as much good news as we can this year. So. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to put up a picture of your parents here. Lovely couple. Brigitte. Yep. And you're all from Switzerland, correct? Yes, uh, my parents are Swiss and also I, I, I feel very Swiss, even after 22 years in Tuscany, I still feel very Swiss. I grew up in Switzerland, in Zurich, and uh, we, we came to Tuscany in 1981 just to spend our Christmas holiday here. It was not the idea to move the family from Zurich to, to Florence. But uh, when we came here for our holidays, uh, my parents, uh, they fall in love with, uh, with the region, with the people, with the food, and also, of course, with the wine. So um, they looked around uh, for uh, a holiday house. Uh, you have to know that from Zurich, you have like six, seven hours drive by car uh, to be in, in the Chianti Classica region. So it's a perfect spot for a holiday house. Yes. And, uh, when they found their house, uh, which also already had the name Brancaia at that time, uh, they, uh, they purchased it suddenly. It was just love at the first sight. And uh, beside the house, there were some acres of vineyards, just a few, but uh, enough to, to have a new hobby. And my, my parents, they, they still take their hobbies very serious. <laughs> so uh, they said, okay, if we have to become hobby winemaker, we want to make uh, outstanding wines, never ever making any kind of compromising quality. And this is pretty much the only thing that's still the same in all those years. When, when they bought that estate in 1981, were there vines planted? Was there a vineyard there already? Here? There were seven hectares of vineyards, but uh, in, the, in the old fashioned way, the old fashioned way means the red uh, grapes and white grapes were mixed and okay. the quality was not really bad, but of course also not outstanding. So we, not, not that in the first year, but let's say in the first uh, three years, we replanted everything. Okay. And that is, let me get another picture up here. Now that was in Castellina, you said, right? That was in Castellina, yes. It's a, a little bit outside of Castellina. A couple of miles, a beautiful house, which is today um, a holiday. This is Rada. This is where I am right now. Okay. Right. But yes, you um, are. But Rada is, I, people that have, don't know this, a little bit further north and east of um, Castellina, correct? Yes, generally speaking, Rada, uh, Rada is a little bit higher than Castellina. So uh, very often the vegetation is in Rada a little bit behind, which uh, it's, it's great because you can do many works first at the, at the Castellina estate and then when you are done in Castellina you go to Rada and do the same work. Okay. It's a and bit you, fresher, it's cooler. And you, you have grapes from both, you have a Chianti Classico and a Chianti Classico Reserva and you use grapes from both estates in that wine, correct? Yes, so at, at Francaia, we so far we don't make a wine from a single vineyard. So uh, what we try actually to do, we try to achieve with each single uh, block we have the quality of uh, for our top wine, which means in the Chianti Classico region for uh, the Francaia in blue, and uh, in the Maremma region it means for the Ida Traia uh, black label, so the black label. And then exactly. So 
uh, there is no vineyard where we say, okay, this will be our entry uh, level wine. We dream somehow that each single spot does have the potential to end up in our top wine. And only when we do pick the grapes, when they do fermentate separately, we start uh, to realize, okay, this will be probably our uh, uh, high-end wine or our entry level wine. But okay. there is no... There is always the dream in the vineyards that everything could end up in the best. And when we do uh, start to, to fermentate and to mature our wines in the cellar, they are still all separate. And just a few weeks, rarely more than a month, we will start to blend the wines before the bottling. So we can really follow the quality and the single character of each single spot. But that means, of course, that all our labels, even the single variety labels, are a blend. All right. Tell us also about the Morema estate. When, when did that come along? What was the decision? Was it a, a marketing decision or did, did they find another property in the Morema that they really loved or how did that come about? Well, that was in, uh, we started to look around in, in, in the mid 90s. Uh, at that time, the, the hobby of my parents has become already a bit more serious and it was already clear that I will join the business. I was already studying winemaking. So uh, my parents had some, some other idea, well, it would be nice to grow. Uh, but uh, we wanted to grow somewhere else, still in Tuscany, uh, because we do think uh, you really have to be close by to, to do the work as we want to do it, but we wanted to have a different spot. And Marema was, was a great decision because it's just uh, 100 kilometers, so it's like a one hour drive by car. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's totally different. So you go from the countryside, from Tuscany to the, to the south coast, from a continental climate. To, uh, to, to a climate with a very strong impact from the sea, from the ocean. Uh, it's, it's drier, it's uh, hotter, so you will have a totally different maturation of the grapes. You can follow the same philosophy, the same idea of winemaking, but the end result will be totally different. And that, so it was not, it was really the idea of having more wine, but in a different way, in a different spot. Right. It, 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 I, is it only the Bordeaux varieties that are planted in Marema at your estate? No, we have also some Sanchevese, okay. but uh, personally, and this is not true for the whole Marema, this is just true for our spot. Uh, we are very close to the sea. It's, it's, it's not 10 kilometers, very low sea level. It goes from, from uh, not even 50 up to 125. Very often we can see the, the, the rain clouds and they just will go over our heads and in, in the back it will rain, but not at our spot. I just mentioned at the beginning, it's right now, it's rainy, but it's raining because the classic region at the beach, uh, we didn't have any rain. So uh, very, very close by, but a total different spots. And in for the Sanchevese, most years we do need irrigation in the Marema. And for the Petit Verdo, the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Cabernet Franc, we don't need any irrigation. That means they really do mature perfectly by dry farming every year. And I'm a big fan of dry farming. I believe that uh, the grapes do have a stronger connection with the soil, that they do um, create flavors which are not just typical for the grape variety, but for the spot where they do grow. And that's actually what we are really looking for. We want to make elegant, well-balanced wine with a very strong link to where they do grow. Okay. You mentioned irrigation is, I know, for example, in Piemonte, they're not allowed to do that unless it's an emergency, they, they get permission. What, is it allowed in the Maremma and, and throughout Tuscany? Uh, well, uh, in the in the Chianti Classico region, if you do produce the Chianti Classico, it's not allowed. Okay. Uh, if you do produce a, a ICT or what, what you call normally in the US a super task, and you can do it. Okay. Uh, but honestly speaking, in the Chianti Classico region, in the last 22 years, there was probably once or twice where it would have been nice to have irrigation, but in a normal year, you don't need it. And also in the Marema, it really depends. Marema is big, you know, Marema goes also into the mountains, so you will have totally different microclimates in, and in, in many spots you can mature perfectly well the San Chavese by dry farming, not in our place. Okay. Well, let's start to talk about some of the wines. And um, mm -hmm. I want to thank your importer in the United States, Lux, for helping me out with this. And I know they bring in, I think it's four wines of yours, four red wines, right? 
Yes. I, I was, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to visit. I'm sorry about that last year, last September up there, but. Hopefully, but, hopefully next time. <laughs> right. I asked the consortio, you know, they put together most, most of my visits, but we, I missed you, but I did get to have your white wine, which is not in the United States, but it was lovely. It was the first night I was there at a, a Trattoria in Firenze. And just Thank you. Sauvignon Blanc of Vignette. It was lovely yes. wine. It's and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of our white wine. It's, it's uh, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I'm Swiss, I'm not Italian, so I like, I like a nice acidity. I need an acidity, so our wine, our white wine is probably more the Nordic, Nordic style and not that much Tuscan style. It's, right. it's very fresh, uh, it does have, doesn't make any malolactic to keep the acidity as high as possible. Uh, and also there it's a blend not only of the two grapes, as you mentioned, Sauvignon Blanc and Viognier, but also the two regions. So the Sauvignon Blanc is coming from the County Classica region and the Viognier from our Marema estate. Okay. Are there many other producers that grow Sauvignon Blanc in County Classico? I can't imagine. No. <laughs> I didn't think so. Okay. Yeah. And, well, I just find it, I mean, it was a lovely wine and then just, I also, it was my first night there, I thought I'm going to try enough red wines the next five days and then it was continuing on the Piemonte it's like so the next 10 days it's like I, I need some white so <laughs> it, it just is refreshing yeah that's you don't have the alcohol levels the same as the, the red so but anyway let's move on to the wines that are brought into the United States and and that as far as your export markets other countries is it pretty much the same with the four red wines or like in well, Japan, yeah, or Russia. Yeah, in, in, in a lot of markets, not in all, uh, we do have the whole portfolio and then of course it depends. In the US, as you mentioned, we have uh, four red wines. We have the, the Bancaya Tre, uh, which is the this label here. It's our, I'd say, baby super Tuscan. It's a wine we produce since 2000. It's a, a blend of uh, our free estate, so the Tukyamte Classic estate and the Marema estate. And at the meanwhile, it's also a blend of free grapes of Sanchevese, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. So free estates, free grapes, and that's why we call this wine Tre, which is the Italian word for free. It's a wine which was works for 12 months in tonneaux, so small barrels and concrete. It's, uh, it's a serious red wine, and as, as I mentioned before, we don't make uh, grapes in vineyards for the Tre, okay? We focus on the roux, so it's, it, it does have a really pretty uh, structure, uh, a serious character without being really complicated. Easy drinking and works with pretty much any kind of food. Yes, I, I would That's agree. I, I, I was impressed by the wine. I tried it last night. I've had it before, but it's uh, some people, you know, they talk about Brancaya and said, well, this is their introductory wine, and that would be a, a totally wrong, you know, definition of that wine because that, that makes it sound like it's something you just pop the cork and drink it. And it's very soft and light and the wine has structure, the wine will age. Yeah, it's, it's you know, for me, the tray is the perfect solution as a winemaker and it's a really good offer for the wine uh, consumer because it helps me to never ever make compromise on our top wines. Uh, I can do total crazy things in the vineyards which do cost a fortune without risking that I have to sell my grapes or a uh, bulk wine because it wouldn't be good enough for you. Right. But all this work, all this passion, all this, this, this energy uh, is not lost because I know I can at least do a really pretty cool wine which is drinkable and it's just bottled, but it can also too easily uh, some years in your cellar. By the way, I, I mentioned other markets, by the way. How's, how's, your, how's the Swiss market for you? I imagine it's pretty good. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, the Swiss market is a special market because it's, it's like our second home market. Of course. Um, and we are, my family is, is, is our own importer. Uh, but of course, also, we, we all markets uh, did suffer. Uh, coronavirus had an impact on us in, in every country. Uh, but let's say, which is, is not only is true, I guess, for Switzerland, but people do drink wine and they do drink still good quality wine. Okay, it's, it's, it's probably the first time in our history that people do not, if, if not, of course, not everybody can allow, but who can allow is still eating and drinking on a high level. 
Uh, so uh, our our shop business and online business is working very well, but of course restaurants, um, many restaurants are still closed, events right. are not happening, catering are not happening. So um, it, it's it's very similar to other countries. Right. Well, I was going to say that for the end, but we could talk about that now if you'd like, but just with the, with the COVID-19 and um, how much, uh, well, I, is, have, the, have the wineries reopened yet or not? Do you, can you have visitors or not yet? Yes, st since uh, two weeks we are allowed to have visitors. Uh, also our little restaurant we have is again open. Uh, we have some some reductions, so you have to guarantee the, the distance. Uh, in our right. private tasting where we uh, host normally 12 people, now we have like space for eight people, just you know that everybody really feels comfortable. Uh, fortunately, we have a, a huge outdoor space where we can really give the people enough space uh, to enjoy the wine. But honestly, there are not very many people around yet. Uh, it's um, very much um, focused on the on the weekends, and most of the people are Italians right now. Okay. Uh, of course, we do hope that this will change in the next weeks, but uh, it's we need we need people to come to Italy. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> and and um, it, I heard last night, and we talked before we started here, with, that the, Italy has opened the borders up to several countries, not all countries, but correct. Yes, and, and uh, let's say more or less uh, the rest of Europe uh, opened their boards uh, today, probably. Oh, today, okay. Uh, so it's, it's uh, things should move. It, it, it's really, it's really, we will have to see if people do, have, or if they are afraid to move around. Tuscany, honestly, it almost never really, I was never scared in Tuscany, okay? We didn't have a lot of, of cases. Uh, the, 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 Big issue Italy had was, was was quite far away, so Tuscany never ever felt like 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 uh, dangerous, not at all. Good, that's good to know. I, I did hear more about the north with, with the Lombard yes, in Milan and somewhat in Piedmont. Exactly. Okay. Good. Okay. But uh, probably you know they didn't know how to handle different regions, so they shut down the whole country. But I mean, also in Sicily, for example, that was there's nothing. You know, it's but uh, it, it is how it is, and we just have to try uh, to move forward and, and, and hope that people are not afraid to visit us because uh, it's still beautiful and, um, and a lot of things to see and to do. Well, I think, I can imagine some people would be a little nervous, but I think enough people will want to get out. They're just tired of staying at home. And, and uh, I think so. what, what better place to go to than Chianti Classico, so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about your Chianti Classico. You have a Chianti Classico sure. Armata and also a Reserva. So, exactly, we have we have uh, as you mentioned the Donata and the Reserva. Actually, okay. Donata is in north in the U.S. Just the uh, Reserva you can find. Okay. But uh, if I if you let me, I will I will explain you both of them because Please. it's actually Please. a very interesting call. Okay. Uh, the Chianti Classico Armata and the Reserva Chianti Classico. They want to show you with the the two opposite you can do in our region today. Uh, on one side, you have Donata, which is a 100% Sangiovese, and it's the only red wine where we don't use any oak. So it matures in concrete and in stainless steel. It's very fresh, nice acidity, clean, a lot of these nice uh, cherry fruit flavors, which are very typical for the Sangiovese. And then on the other side, you have the Riserva, Chianti Classico, which wants to show how elegant and well structured Sanchevese can be. And here you go from 100% Sanchevese to 80% Sanchevese and 20 Merlot. So, uh, and from no oak to 16 months oak. The Reserva matures uh, in, in um, Dono for the Sanchevese and in Boric for the Merlot. It's a, a complex wine with uh, very smooth, nice tannins and still a nice freshness of facility. Most people do have today the idea that this is somehow the classic uh, way of doing, the traditional way of doing a Chianti Classico Donata, which is true and not true. Uh, because officially we can make 100% Sanchevese and call it a Chianti Classico only since a few years. 
Right. So for this, it's not traditional at all to do a 100% central Asian colleague anti-classical, but it is traditional in a way because it's a light wine, it's light in color, it's also pretty light in alcohol and no oak, so it's very fresh and clean. This is a bland wine, which is somehow more traditional than, than the other wine, but that's of course 20% is Merlot and Merlot again is a French, originally a French grape. It seems a bit more modern wine, but uh, for me, both of them are very much linked uh, to, to where they grow. And as all our wines, they, um, they do a natural fermentation, so we don't get any yeast in the cellar. All the yeasts for the fermentation, they are coming from our vineyards and of course also from our cellar. Okay, a uh, couple of questions about these two wines. First of all, the year, the vintage on the Ganta Classico Anata, what is the current vintage? Um, we have uh, in, 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 in the market tonight, right now the 18. 18, okay. Yeah. Which we'll talk about 15 and 16, which I, I know are you know, back to back excellent vintages, maybe even outstanding. How was 18 in Ganta Classico? 18 was also very nice. We had, we had a, a, a difficult vintage with the 17. 17 was very hot, uh, but I think that we managed it very well. Uh, we had a, a low production, but the quality we were able to, to get into the cellar is really interesting. And 18 is, is uh, again, really, uh, I, would, I would compare it to 16. Okay, that's, well, that's, that's pretty high praise because it's 16. Is yeah. That's an amazing vintage. And the fact that you, you, you said it, it, it's 100% Sangiovese, you can only do that since maybe the last 10 years or so. But mm -hmm. um, there's always that argument, and I want to get your thoughts on this, that you know many producers still use very traditional indigenous varieties such as Caneolo or Colorino, along with Sangiovese. And they, they say for the complexity, it adds spice, it adds color, it adds, you know, it, 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 to them it's a more complete wine than 100% Sangiovese, and then other people say, no, Sangiovese is, is the great of Piano Classico. This is the one that gives all the richness and character. So it's, I mean, it, it, there's no wrong or right answer, but what, what was the decision on that? Just, uh, yeah, just as you said, there's no, no right and no wrong, and that's the great thing about wine. Um, there, are, there are a lot of options to do many, many things. I, I have to say, Tom, that you know, when I joined Brancaia, most of our vineyards in the Chianti Classico were already planted, okay? So there was no, um, and, and let's say the school or the, the way where I entered, it was very much like, you know, everything, single vineyard and everything from Sanchevese to French grapes and not to all other Italian varieties. Today, I, I think both ways are equally great, but my way does not have so much to do with which grape, but I want to work with all wines, okay? I believe that all, as older a wine is, as more interesting is to the, is the grape. Mm -hmm. So uh, we also, we all the, the, the plants we have to replant is seen a couple of years old from our own materials. So we make a muscle system in each single property. We do reproduce our own um, wines because we really do think that as long as a wine stays as our property, as more it is linked to our terroir, it will make Little tiny little micro changement on the DNA. Don't get me wrong. I won't say that we have uh, our own clone after 20 and 25 years, but we have those tiny little micro changements on the DNA, which helps the wine to be more adapted to our spot, to our microclimate, to our soil, which I believe helps to create or to achieve a ripeness, uh, which is just more authentic. Uh, if it's a French grape variety originally or an Italian, it doesn't really matter that, that much to me. It's more that it is at the perfect spot for the, for the wine. Okay. Now with, with the Reserva, you blend in Merlot. And yes. there's the thought that, you know, Merlot ripens much earlier than Sangiovese. And in certain years, you know, when it's cool, Kind of classical can kind of the ripening can kind of come up against the, the, the rains in October or late September. 
And, uh, you know, the Merlot would already have been picked by then. So the Merlot sometimes could sort of save the Chianti Classico in a, you know, in, in an off year, not every year, but um, is there any thought of, that's why you put Merlot in, or is it just, you feel it's a nice complimentary variety? How does that, how do you feel on that? I truly think it's 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 a great combination, uh, and I personally think that the Sanchevese does have a, a great structure by its own. But there is no doubt that with the Merlot, uh, it, you you will have a bit of smoother, rounder finish in your mouth. Okay. And as you just mentioned, uh, also to let's say to have the same quality each vintage or at least a similar or in the best uh, uh, opportunity even a better than the one before this, the, the Merlin in certain vintages does help definitely but uh, I mean we have a project and, and I hope that with the vintage 18 uh, it will be it will be in the bottle uh, to make 100% Sanchevese from the Rada spot and from the Castellina just a few bottles to show the difference of those two uh, spots. And though this, this, this label will be 100% Sanchevese. And I think it's very interesting to see uh, the difference of, of, of uh, two regions which are so close, but at the meantime also very different. And of course, as soon as you do add the Merlot, you won't smell them anymore. So it has to be 100% uh, Sanchevese. Okay. And in, in this reserve, it's 20% Merlot, am I correct? Yes. Okay, and because the minimum requirement for Chianti Classico is 80% Sangiovese, correct? Yeah, yeah. They, they changed it a few times, and right now it's 80%. It was yeah, once I, 85, and now it's 80, yeah. Yeah, I know. Every time I look, it's different, but it's like, but, it's, <laughs> it's, but, but those are the Italian laws. If, anybody, if anyone could pick up, could understand. <laughs> My joke is always if, if I wrote a book about Italian wine laws, by the time I finished the book, it would be out of date. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And it, because the other parts of Chianti, like Chianti Colli Senesi or Chianti Colli Fiorentini, it's 75% minimum, right? For Sangiovese, so. I think so, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard to keep up with this, so. Uh, now the, the, um, the vintage on the Reserva is 2015. And I mentioned 15 and 16 being two really outstanding vintages in, uh, I, I would say outstanding, it's certainly excellent. Um, talk about the two vintages. I've, I've talked to many winemakers and some prefer the 15, some prefer the 16, but they all agree that these are two pretty special vintages. So you talk a little bit about that. Talk now about Chianti Classico, about 15 and 16. Um. Well, I have to agree. I mean, uh, both both vintages are outstanding. Um, if if you do have to compare or to say what could be better in one or the other, that's complaining on a very very high level. Right. Um, <laughs> so I would say for Brancaia, especially for Brancaia Il Blu, I probably prefer slightly the sixteen. I think uh, it's even a bit more complex. Uh, there is a, a little bit more freshness in it than in the 15. Um, for the Morema, for the La Traia, it's probably the opposite that I do think that the 15 has, does have a light, little tiny tick more than the 16. So, but I mean, um, if, if I could have every year uh, like a 15 or like a 16, I would take it. <laughs> I can, imagine, I can imagine. And, and if anybody has a problem with either one of those two, yeah, that's. But um, and um, so, and getting back to the, um, and I'm enjoying a glass of the 15 Reserva here. So, okay, love the lovely wine. Yeah. Cheers for a virtual. Cheers. Toast, yeah. Um, you mentioned you'll have a few bottles of a, a Castellina Chianti Classico and a Rada Chianti Classico. This will just be in-house sales, so so to speak, or will that be exported also? Um, I, I can imagine that, that, that uh, a few markets uh, will be interested in having those bottles or, uh, I mean, you know, 
probably some months ago, I would have told you, Tom, that's just for who is coming to the winery. Okay, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right now, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if enough people are coming to the winery, so exactly. I may have to, right. to rethink. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So that, that brings up the question of, um, and I want to get an update on this from you, but when I was there last year, I talked with um, Giovanni Minetti, who's the president of, of the Ghent Classico Consortio, and I asked him about the uh, thought of zonazione, or is labeling mm -hmm. Canna Classico would say, you know, if it's approved that, you know, wines could be labeled Canna Classico, Rada in Chianti, or Gaioli in Chianti, or Castellina in Chianti, or, or, you know, whatever the commune. And I, I want to first get your thoughts on that, and then if you could update me on, on, you know, this is an ongoing thing, and I know it's difficult for, to get a lot of people to agree on this, and everybody has their own opinion, so. It, it, how does that stand, that, that, uh, that uh, process? It, it, how far along are, are you on, on that? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, it's, it's definitely true that uh, the different regions do um, focus and promote themselves more and more. So, of course, there are still great events organized by Galo Nero, and Galo Nero means, of course, the whole Chianti Classica region. Uh, but there are more and more events also which do focus on showing the producer from Roda, the producer from Castellina, the producer from, from Greve. So uh, they, they definitely do try more and more to explain that we have um, different, different sub uh, regions in the Chianti Classico uh, area. I personally, uh, I'm not always totally convinced um, how, how useful this is because when you taste wines I do have somehow uh, the idea that sea level does have very often more impact than if it's in Rada or in Castellina or in Panzano uh, and more we have a bit of difference of the soil which is also not so um, that it really follows the, the political borders so um, I there, there again is probably no wrong and right, and, and whatever shows people how, how beautiful our region is and how many great wines and great wine producers we have, I think works well for me too. There is nothing, nothing that it harms to, to, to show that, that there are uh, different, different groups of wineries in, in, in this uh, big, because Castellina, uh, Castellina, sorry, because the, the Chianti Classica region is a big wine region. So splitting it up and, and showing that there are uh, microclimates and, and, and differences in, in one spot and the other, why not? Okay. Yeah, I I think the more information, the better. I think sometimes yeah. maybe maybe it can be a little bit too much, and, and uh, it's interesting because I mean you're not dealing here with a very obscure wine territory. You're dealing with Chianti Classico, which is I think is probably the the, the most well loved red wine around the world. It it may not be the most. It's also one of the most famous. But I, I say that because it's you know, we're not we're not dealing with a hundred dollar bottles of wine here. We're dealing with very reasonably priced wines. And it, the markets everywhere can, can buy, buy this wine. So, you know, maybe you don't want to mess too much with the good thing. It's, uh, we, we still have probably, but uh, I mean, it, 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 it changed so much and, and we really have so great uh, wines in, in, in our region. But we, we, of course, do still struggle with a lot of people uh, who doesn't really know the difference between Chianti and Chianti Classico. But uh, we are working on it and, uh, and, and it's improving. Okay, good. Let's, uh, let's move to the Maremma. Mm -hmm. and, uh, virtually speaking, of course. And you, you make how many wines from the Marema? Well, uh, as wines which are uh, sourced 100% from the Marema estate, we do actually a rosé. Okay. Uh, then we have 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, which is like, like the little brother of the La Traia. And then we have the Ila Traia. Those wines are 100% from the Marema estate. Um, as I mentioned before, the white wine does have a tiny little bit of the Viognier from the Marema and the Tre is two-third from the Marema, so it's a blend. Uh, but three wines of our portfolio are 100% from the Marema estate. 
And the, the rosé, is that a blend of different grapes or is it just one variety? No, it's 100% Merlot. Merlot, okay. Yeah. And now I know for the Elatraya, you use some Cabernet Franc. I've got a question here from one of the attendees and she wants to know when did you start working with Cabernet Franc? We started actually in the beginning when uh, when we when we bought the estate. Well, actually, it was not really an estate; it was just a piece of land. So we we planted our first Cabernet Franc in uh, in ninety nine. Nineteen ninety. Okay. So let, let's talk about that that Ilatraya, which is really kind of one one of your signature wines. Tell us how how that came along, how you developed that wine, and how long you've been making that. Ilatraya, we started with Ilatraya um, in 2002, so in the early days of our estate, and it was, it was a bit of a surprise to me because I don't know who does remember, but 2002 was considered as a very bad vintage in Tuscany. It was uh, cool and rainy, and you have to know when people do say it's cool and rainy in Tuscany, that means that in our Marima estate we have some rain, okay, okay. <laughs> which is not bad at all. <laughs> so uh, we were able to to produce uh, pretty interesting quantity, but of course even more interest, important, a real exciting quality with the 2002 vintage. So I was like, oh, what shall I do? Uh, shall I really shall I really produce the first uh, top wine of this estate, or shall I wait another year? And then I thought, oh, it's too good. I have to try. It. And so we did our first blend in La Tria, uh, with the vintage 2002, but it was. It was a different label. Uh, it was not the classical Brancaia label. It had a uh, little service and it was a different blend. So the first few years of Villa Traia, it was a blend of 60 Cabernet Sauvignon, 30 Sanchevese and 10 Petit Verdo. So there was no Cabernet Franc. There was uh, less Petit Verdo and there was some Sanchevese in uh, the, the beginning. And then with the vintage 2009, we uh, switched the label and uh, we also changed the blend. So in our days, the blend of Villa Traia is a 4% Petit Verdo, 40 Cabernet Sauvignon and 20 Cabernet Franc. As I mentioned, we, we kicked out the Sanchevise. We increased quite a lot the Petit Verdo and we added the Cabernet Franc. There are a few reasons why. But let's say the, the, the most important one is something I already mentioned before. We believe in dry farming. We believe that we can achieve the better quality, food quality by dry farming than by irrigation. Those three grapes do mature each year perfectly by dry farming. So Chivese does have the issue that in most vintages we do need to irrigate. So we think we have, even if there is no uh, classical Italian grape in this plant, we think that we achieved a more authentic wine with, uh, with the Bordeaux blend than with the blend we had before. And that's why we changed. Okay, tell me a little bit about the, the three varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, and Cabernet Franc in the Maremma. Because I talked to some winemakers there and they say Cabernet Franc just performs just spectacularly in the Maremma. And tell me about them and which ripens first and, and what, are, what does each variety add to the wine? So, well, it's the, the, the Cabernet Sauvignon is very elegant, uh, does have a, a, also a nice uh, acidity. So it, it gives somehow the, the longness and, and the freshness to the wine. The, the, the Petit Verdo, which is in our spot probably the most easiest uh, variety to, to mature. Uh, it really feels totally at home uh, at our spot. Gives uh, extremely deepness and, and power to the wine. And the Cabernet Franc gives a certain spiciness to it. Okay. And, and when do those grapes ripen? Which, which ripens first? Which, what's the order of ripening? Um, it's funny because in the first year it was very clear and today it's not that clear anymore. So in the, in the, in the first years it was really like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, then the Petit Verdot and the Laces was the Cabernet Franc. Um, in, 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 in the last, let's say, five years we have at least one block of Petit Verdot. We do pick uh, mostly even before the Cabernet Sauvignon and then it will be the Cabernet Sauvignon. And then very often in between another Petit Verdot, then the Cabernet Franc, and then we have another Petit Verdot, which will be the latest. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it has changed in, 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 in those years. It was in the first, let's say, 10 years, it was like, 
very clear one after the other and and in in the I would say in the last 10 years, it's, it's, it's really more, if it's lower sea level and what kind of soil it does have, it changed uh, and it's not, you, we, have, we have like the first pretty well and then in the middle and the last. Okay, and I, I'm curious, since you're in both Cante Classico and the Maremma, anybody who travels through Cante Classico is, certainly knows about the Chingali, the wild boar that can come in and eat the grapes and that you have to do everything you can to keep those, those animals out, but it, is that a problem in the Maremma also, or? It is. Uh, it's, um, you will hardly see any, any vineyards which are not uh, fenced. So today, uh, and the big difference is that it will be fenced all the whole year round, but honestly, that's not because of the wild boars. The wild boars are an issue. They are an issue during harvest. Okay. They are really gourmets. They love the grapes and they love the grapes when they're ready to pick. Like so, uh, I, right. it, happened, it happened to us once that, uh, that we went in the, in the afternoon, we controlled the vineyard and it was like, okay, this is ready to pick. And uh, next morning there was hardly anything left. Oh my God. This is, <laughs> this is really bad. But um, as I mentioned, that this, the, the, the white boars are only a risk during harvest. But we have seen, I would say, more than 10 years, we have uh, a big issues with deers. And, and they, unfortunately, they love also the young tender leaves just when the wine does start to grow. So uh, if, if you want to produce wine in Tuscany, you need high fans the whole year round, unfortunately. Okay, well, yeah, all part of doing business. I, I've got to, uh, let me ask, how many bottles of the uh, Elytria do you make? And, and how, how big is that estate? How many, how many acres of vineyard, how many hectares? Um, hectares, it's around 40 hectares also in the Marima. So we have uh, approximately 40 hectares in the County Classic and 40 in the Marima. Um, from the Ilatraya, we have, a, of course, it, it won't be each year exactly the same, but it's, it's roughly uh, 50,000 bottles. Okay. And the Ilatraya, the current release is 2015, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, how will the, can we say the same for the 15 and the 16 with the Ilatraya as compared to the Cante Classico Reserva in terms of freshness and acidity and what you prefer? I, I do think that the, 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 the 15 probably does have a little and a little more, more um, as I mentioned before, it's complaining on an extreme high level, right. but uh, the 15 does have probably slightly more complexity than, than, than the 16. Okay. So okay. it's for me a bit the opposite to, to what, I, what I do think about the blue. Okay. I've got a question here from Lars Light. Hello, Lars, thank you for joining us. I love this question. Since you mentioned you produce a rosé from Merlot and the Maremma, he says, what, is, what does Barbara see as the future of rosé on the market? It's not a tradition in Tuscany, but in the U.S., Provence has taken the lead on the rosé market. Can Tuscany and Italy in general compete? Well, as you may can see the color, this is not a typical Tuscan rosé, okay? This is very much pale. more Provost style. Right. Uh, it's, it's very light in color, also pretty light in alcohol. It never ever should be more than 12.5. Uh, we do pick those grapes only morning hours. They go straight ahead into the tank, so there is no skin contact, of course. Skin contact you have to impress him, but not more, and that gives this wine a very light color. Yes. Um, do, you, do you have production? Do you have production facilities right there in the Maremma? Do you have to ship the grapes? Yes. Okay. No, we have we have we have a cellar. We do the whole fermentation maturation of the wine in the Maremma, and uh, they will come to the Chianti Classico estate only for bottling. So bottling line, we just have one. The, the whole part of fermentation and maturation we do have at the Marina spot. Uh, but to, back to the question, uh, no, I don't think that uh, Tuscan rosés will compete to uh, Provost rosé. Uh, the, the, the consumer is looking for French rosé, especially from Provence, and I don't really think that will change very soon. But uh, uh, there is no doubt that you can find very, very nice rosés uh, in Tuscany and in Italy. 
Yeah, it's well, it's certainly I've noticed the last four or five vintages, it's, it's been an explosion of rosé from, I mean, everywhere in Italy, and not just Tuscany or Piemonte, but, uh, but also from Sicily. And of course, Puglia is the most famous in, in Italy for the rosés, which it, it was a good percent of the market, but it seems like everyone wants to kind of get on the bandwagon, so to speak, and produce a rosé. But, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, and that, that was before coronavirus. So, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, just to add in the uncertainty now and who knows what, how, what, how, what will happen. But let me go back. Just I have a question here from one of the panelists, one of the uh, attendees, and um, go back to Tusk, the Canada Classico, excuse me. And he says, what is the elevation, the altitude of the vineyards in Rada and Castellina? In Castellina, we are roughly between 250 up to 350, and in Rada, from more or less 350 up to 450. For Rada, uh, that means still pretty low, okay? Rada goes up uh, to 600 uh, meters sea level, so we are, for Rada, uh, a winery which is pretty low on sea level, and for the Castellina estate, we are, let's say, in the middle, okay? There are some, some vineyards, some estates, they are higher, but there are also quite a few that are lower from, okay. sea, uh, from the point of sea level. Okay. I have another question from Lars, and he said, this is... This is just for fun, but he says, since you're Swiss and you live in Italy, he said, are, are there any frustrating aspects uh, about, you know, your existence in, in Tuscany? And, and he also wants to know what's, what's the most gratifying part of, of living in, in Tuscany or living in Italy, I should say. The, the most positive or the most negative part? No, the most positive, and then just each one, you know, let's know if there's anything frustrating about the bureaucracy or about. No, I mean, f frustrating, of course, uh, timing is, is a, a total unknown factor, which is always uh, frustrating, of course, for everybody. But, uh, you know, living in, in one of the most beautiful um, countries in, in Tuscany and having a job where you can work with nature and, and uh, create wines. It does um, does have a lot of benefits. So even even if there are a few things which are uh, a bit frustrating, there are many many more which uh, to com compensate it uh, more than enough. How, how often do you get back to Switzerland per year? Um, four to five times. Well, that's that's quite a bit. I, I would admit. Normally, normally I haven't been this year yet. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is not a normal year. It's just yeah. <laughs> I haven't been to Italy yet this year, and that's that's a <laughs> I'm going through withdrawal here. But and uh, I would imagine that you must have a pretty uh, large team that helped you. I mean, you've got three different estates. Um, what, what's your typical day? I mean, you I'm assuming you, it's not too far to travel, but you're in you visit you know each estate several times a week. I imagine, but um, well. Yeah. Absolutely true. We are we are a big team, and without without great people uh, helping me, that wouldn't be possible. Uh, but uh, I do live personally at one spot, so I do have my private house in the middle of the vineyards in the Rada estate. Yes. And and Rada and Castellina, that's really close by. There's just a, a few minutes, so that's that's very very easy, let's say, uh, to to be often also in the Castellina estate. And in the Maremma, it really depends. Uh, during during harvest and uh, probably also the the whole month before harvest. So more more or less from the first August, I will be close to every day also in the Marema just to see what's going on during harvest. Mostly every day, uh, but in in the in meantime, it could be once a week. In the winter, it can be also less. Okay, I have another question here from one of the attendees and he wants to know about climate change. And he says, is it pushing you to higher elevation? So I mean, as far as planting or, and then he says, or changing grapes. I'm not exactly sure what he means here, but maybe just the, the, the difference in the blend and maybe one, one variety might have more acidity or how has climate change affected your, your uh, work in the vineyards and work in the cellar? That's a good and, and, and a difficult question. Um, in in my in my little tiny world, I I do live. I uh, can't say that we have every year a warmer year, but we go uh, 
so far in a, in a good range, okay, in a manageable range, we go to more extreme years. So we go from pretty hot and dry year to quite cool and fresh years, and rainy years. Um, what we are doing at Brancaia is with what I mentioned before, we focus very much to, um, to achieve our wines, uh, or to let's say to create an environment to our wines that they can uh, get older and older. We believe that an older wine is more adapted to those changed than a young one. That a wine which is growing at our spot for more than 20 years uh, can manage those different vintages much, much better than, than uh, if you replant something. Okay. So that's a bit how we try to manage it. And so far, um, the, the changements we have are manageable. Okay. Is, is that something, I'm curious with the consortium, since you're a member of that, virtually all of wineries are, but is that climate change, has that been a, a matter of discussion the last few years among the members of the consortium? I mean, what, 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 you, what you can see very well, uh, there are more and more wineries, they do uh, convert to, to be organic. Uh, there are also quite a few, they are uh, biodynamic. So there is definitely an uh, awareness to, to uh, preserve nature, to respect nature more and more and more. And, and uh, the consortia is also definitely going in this direction and they do, they do support those uh, evolutions. And how, we shouldn't put labels on things, but everybody wants to know, you know, is this a sustainable estate, biodynamic, organic? What is your farming philosophy principle? Um, well, uh, we are officially, uh, since the vintage 2019, we are an organic uh, winery. We started many years before, and honestly, when I studied winemaking, my, my exam was on, on, on organic farming because it was already then for me very important. But when I moved to Tuscany, it was like, that's not possible. So it took me a while uh, to understand why it's not possible, and then I understood it is possible, and then it took me a long while to, to start it and, and what I do think, whatever you do change, you have to do it soft, okay? You can't go one day in one direction right, and right. then the next day in another. So uh, you have to give yourself and the nature and the wine a couple of years time uh, to adapt. And, uh, but I mean, as I mentioned, it's now 12 years that we make all our wines to make um, a natural fermentation and that shows already pretty well that that how we do work in the vineyards allows uh, the flora and fauna to grow in a, in a healthy and good way. Okay. Uh, you do not produce a Vinsanto, but it's that just because you don't have any Trebbiano and Alcia grapes, or is it just a choice, or it's something you might do in the future? Or? Um, it's, uh, producing Vinsanto is, is beautiful, uh, but it's also not, not that easy and you need also a facility. It's, it's, right, you need right. a, a spot and we just, at the moment today, we don't have, have the spot, we don't have the space, but you never know. Okay. All right. Anything else you want to add about what's happened these last three months in terms of, of, of you know, have, have the, your export markets supported you? Have they been able to place orders or? I'm sure the numbers are down, but how, what has happened and, and what do you see in the immediate future? Uh, that's... <laughs> are you yeah, answer, well, you know, exactly. <laughs> that's a long question. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you, there, there are a few things. First of all, um, we, have, we have a lot of different markets and there's not just one key market. And all of them still try to work and all of them do still work everybody on a, on a lower level so it's it's okay but uh, of course the big question is when 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 will it be over when 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 will be everything like it was before and and understanding how you can uh, do other business or uh, we have in each country the restaurants was a, was a big part of our business and uh, right. this is and still will be for us a big thing and we have a bit to find out but 
there, there's a few partners, they, they are strong or they are getting stronger in online. Uh, the, as I mentioned before, private people do consume still wines at home. So it's just a question how to, uh, how to, to reach them. Right. But, um, and as a winery, we were always able to work. So we always were allowed to go into the vineyards to work. And we were always allowed to go into the cellar to take care about the product quality. So therefore, we really can't complain. We were always able to secure our product, uh, which was, uh, let's say, at least this was possible and, and also with no risk for our people. So that was good. Good. And well, as we talked before, you know, maybe the... Uh the uh, people who live in Switzerland and Germany and, and Austria, you know, will get in their cars very soon and head down and purchase some wine stuff. And uh, that, that won't be hope. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fingers crossed for a great harvest this year. Thank you. And that, and that the uh, borders will be open very soon and that I can visit and everybody else in the United States and other countries. So I'm, I'm dying to get there soon. So we'll see you again. So, Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Grazie per oh, that. Thank you. Thank you for your time and, and all the best to everybody. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Buon lavoro. Andrea, tutto bene. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao.